Hmm. All right, well, uh, hello everybody. Thanks for tuning in to this uh, kind of birch bark canister presentation um, and demonstration. Um, I have a slideshow with some birch bark, photos of birch bark, um, different birch bark crafts, just to kind of turn folks on to, you know, the wide range of uses and functions for the material. And then, uh, and then we'll get into the demonstration. Um, this will be recorded, and then we will be sending out the link to anybody who registered. So whether um, you're here now listening or, um, you know, people who didn't, didn't get here, they can still watch. Um, so let's see here. Um, yeah, this is uh, the last of our sort of free Zoom presentation demonstration stocks uh, it was set up. We've set it up to promote our school that we're just getting going here in Northern Wisconsin. So I hope that uh, you all will uh, make it here someday, take a class or catch me on the road. I'll be in Bremerton, Washington, teaching spoon carving in the fall. But other than that, I'm sticking close to home just with the project. Um, Poly is turning at North House, too, and that'll be in November. Poly is turning in Seattle. All right, and the Seattle area. <laughs> um, the, uh, yeah, the schools, you know, uh, we're, we're still working hard. The upstairs is nearly finished. If, for those who are following along on Instagram, um, you, can, you can see some of the photos. Um, Pretty excited. Um, I'll be moving my stuff into the shop and get working again, hopefully in the next couple of weeks um, and just kind of get things back back in order for making and, and selling and all that and, and teaching, of course. So uh, thanks for those that have donated. Um, we, we really appreciate it. And um, for those who haven't, if you feel like it, um, you can get to our website and, and click the button that says donate to throw it down. It's uh, woodspiritschool.com. I'm sure everybody here already knows what it is, but spread the word. Um, that is always helpful for us. You know, we don't have large marketing budgets and, um, you know, social media is, has its limits. So uh, please spread the word um, and um, use the chat for um, discussion uh, questions. Uh, anything that you might uh, need to ask, and um, I'll, I'll be fielding those as I present, and or Jasmine will as well. And during the demonstration, I will be having my monitor on. Jasmine will have hers on, so she'll be able to field some of those questions. And we'll just pause to make sure that we address address your questions. Um, yeah, and just keep it to the chat. Um, we've tried open mic stuff and it's just gets a little bit complicated and the sound doesn't quite work right sometimes depending on cell signals and stuff so all right let's uh get going here i'm going to screen share and open up the presentation okay so I can see a few of you. You can see this okay, Jasmine. You can see birch bark canisters, yes. black screen. Someone give me a thumbs up. Yeah, okay, good. All right. So when I can see everybody on the side, Jasmine, we were kind of curious on how, how that works, but I can change mine. All right. We're still always working out how this Zoom things work. All right, so here we go. Okay, there we go. All right. Um, I was first introduced to these canisters by a Swede named Ramon Pearson. Um, and he shared with me some of his slides to use uh, for when I taught classes. So some of these are his photos. Um, and the idea is just to show you all a little bit of, of the multiple uses of birch bark. Um, it's a remarkable material. If you have it in your area, count yourself lucky. Um, and if you don't, 
you know, I'm sure that you're going to covet it or I've already coveted having birch bark. It's, it's amazing, pliable, it doesn't rot, it's flexible, um, and it's used for all kinds of things. So here you see this Swedish, uh, rustic Swedish building and underneath those logs, those half logs is, um, it's a roof of a building and underneath that is the, the birch bark strips used kind of like tar paper is today. And we have these little canisters, of course. Um, there's a bunch of three different layers here. Um, this is probably quite small used for ground tobacco when uh, snorting tobacco dust was in, in, in fashion. Little snooze container. Um, and here you can see this birch bark um, on, the, on top of the sill, sill log of a, of a log building. Again, it just protects, the, protects things from moisture um, and also because it's pliable and comes in big sheets, depending on the size of trees that you're, you're harvest from. Um, you have these, these baskets. This is called the Naverkunt. Uh, Naver is uh, Swedish for birch bark. Uh, Kunt, it must be basket or box or something, I'm guessing, or backpack. Um, these have straps on it. Um, there's a wooden frame inside. And obviously it's nailed together, although some were lashed as well. Here's another canister um, from Ramon's um, slideshows. This is made by kind of a famous Swede. Um, he was known for his sort of psychedelic images on his, on his canisters. Uh, Mills, uh, oh, I forget his name now. I don't wanna, I don't wanna, <clears throat> misrepresent who it was but and then you have woven birch bark um, in you know northern Europe uh, Siberia this is this is in Sweden but you Finns Swedes Norwegians uh, Eastern Europe Russian uh, of course Native America anyone who had birch bark used it for for all kinds of things um, here you see this gentleman uh, in his in his flashy woven birch bark hat. And this baby's basket um, is uh, basically a birch bark basket with some bent, bent um, wood, wood limbs, probably juniper and lashed with, with split root. And here's just a really simple um, folded bark basket. Um, this is a, a, probably a Swedish basket, but these were very common in North America. And this was made from one sheet. So if you look close, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but um, there's where it's folded, it's not sliced. It's, it's folded in like kind of like a bit of origami and then lashed with a bit of root. So this would be watertight. It would, it would be a, a, a water, it could hold liquid as a dish. Um, so, you know, you can see some of these designs kind of cross continent. Material dictates design, root, bark, and you have, you have tableware or buckets. Um, here are some examples of my teacher and mentor, uh, Ramon Pearson, his work. Um, really fantastic and he he's known for paint his his elaborate painting not as psychedelic as Nils Drisk is the guy's name um but still following that sort of painted tradition that you see in Scandinavia um side note some of the reasons why is because winter is dull and you just have grays and browns the only maybe color you have is the sky and so interior buildings were were painted if you had paint you'd use it to paint furniture um, the plain wood wasn't very common um, save for outside log buildings and even then um, they would paint with that, that red classic would fall on red paint milk paint so you know he's following a, a strong tradition with with these paint and he's definitely getting elaborate and creative with his stamp work Birch bark is a lot like leather where you can, you can 
stamp it with with various shaped uh, stamps, and then when he's painting, he can wipe off, and you can see see that work. Really fantastic. Um, he was a pretty important part of my kind of when I was learning about craft production and things. Here you can see some stamps up close and you can see that the stamp was made from wood. And you can see if you look closely on those little horseshoe U shapes, you can see the wood grain from that stamp. It's an end grain section, probably oak or ash. So that's the spring and uh, summer rain. Pretty cool. Uh, woven birch bark, of course, really great way of utilizing. And then, of course, here in North America, um, around the Great Lakes region in particular, but all the way up to Alaska as well, people were making bark canoes, of course. That's probably the most iconic birch bark craft, but uh, also they used it for those same reasons because it's waterproof and flexibility and these people were moving around a lot so they would cover these bent bent frame lodges with with uh, birch bark um, basically birch bark tarps sections and held in place by leaning these these poles and saplings the lower half is a woven rush this is a summer lodge or just at least a non-winter lodge here you have a winter lodge um, Ojibwe's in this area, um, it has this long peak instead of the bend. Um, multiple families would kind of team up in the winter. But again, birch bark um, for roofing, birch bark for baskets, for holding things. You know, the early days here in North America, these were Stone Age people, no iron, maybe some copper, but so. Uh, you know, birch bark is going to be a great resource instead of having to try to hollow out bowls out of wood or making buckets would be impossible um, or nearly impossible. And why? When you have uh, a birch bark, you can fold up and you can pitch the seams with spruce pitch and make them water tight. And if you, you make those watertight ones that are folded, you can actually boil liquid in them over a fire, as long as the liquid is higher than the flames are, the bark will not combust. So it's really amazing. Um, Here's some, you know, Great Lake style or, or what they would call muckuck in, in Ojibwe. Um, I used to make a lot of these for the local bands of Ojibwe for, for their gift giving. Um, ceremonies and different different or parts of their tribal organization would give out gifts and so they would hire me to make <clears throat> hundreds of these baskets there wasn't really anybody making them that were making them in mass um here's a modern woven uh i guess that'd be some sort of vase um this is taken at north house so I believe is made by the craftswoman named Julie Keene who teaches up there or has te taught there for many years. Here's another example of the folded style with a lid. Uh, this would be native, native North American. This on the other hand is European, um, possibly Sami or in Northern Sweden, they weren't, um, making as much folded bark as they were woven, but you can see that the smaller pieces from the stunted birch of that northern uh, latitude didn't allow for big, big things to be made, like canoes, for example. So they have multiple pieces laid cross, crisscrossed, and then this elaborate rim system to hold it together. And very similar to the native style folded baskets. There was a question whether uh, the stamps could be used on older bark or if it had to be used on fresh. You could use it on older bark. Um, I'll get into the qualities of bark in a little bit, but um, but uh, not all bark is the same. Maybe you want to crank those down. I don't know. Um, there's another way of making watertight canisters. Um, 
which is to harvest a tube from a, um, a fast growing tree in the springtime. You have to fell the tree and you, you cut a section, you slip a metal rod in. Can you hand me that rod? I got the tool right up here. You'd slide this uh, in between the, the wood and the inner bark. And then because it's fresh grown and very wet, you can, you can, you can kind of separate those two and then slip off that tube you break the inner bark and throw it away because it's brittle and then you have this tube I should have actually just grabbed grabbed uh, an example of one um, but anyway these canisters are made like that where there's an outer layer that has the join that I'm going to talk about and show today that inner layer is a tube that's then folded down around a piece of <clears throat> um, rope or a split root that what makes that little rim. And then you friction fit a base, <clears throat> excuse me, no pegs, and you can make a watertight uh, canister. So, you know, when, when the time is right and I feel like harvesting saplings, usually it's private land when I can go after and cut these trees down. Um, I don't have any good pictures of Ramon, but um, this is Vladimir Yarish a Russian, probably the kind of world expert on bark, birch bark craft. He's come to North House in the States numerous times and he was teaching some classes and I got the opportunity to take some classes with him as to has Jasmine. Um, here he's displaying a woven, uh, traditional woven basket that would hang on the wall that would hold wooden eating spoons for, for dinner time. Interesting guy. Um, and here he has displays of all the things, you know, that you can make from bark, some really fine baskets and these woven figurines and animals. And of course, these canisters here. It's a different way of making them than I'm going to show today, but just to show you different styles. And of course, woven, again, woven trays and things like that. So it's a fantastic material for crafts. Um, here we have some birch bark canoes that I made. Um, you know, for, for those that have followed along my, my path, I used to make these more regularly than I do now. It's been a few years. Um, can't remember what year this is, but at one time I had three or four canoes laying around and until I finally <laughs> actively tried to sell them, uh, which I did. But these are like the iconic um, birch bark craft. This is the last canoe I built in 2016, I believe, for a guy um, up in the Yukon. Birch bark, cedar, split root, pine pitch. You got a question? There was a question a couple back. What, what were the dots on the top of those? Okay. And the Oh, yeah, just a punch, pup, pup, pup. He's just punch and decoration. Kind of looks like a weird cookie or cracker. Knicka Um, Here's some more native baskets with some etching. Um, when you harvest bark at different times of the year, you can get different uh, qualities. Um, I'll talk about that in just a little bit. So in my prime, I was looking for bark for canoes and also for basket crafts, like all those baskets I make for, for the local bands and for sale. Um, we go to National Forest here in, in Northern Wisconsin. There's plenty of National Forest around and anybody who's a citizen can get a permit in an active cut to harvest bark. Um, so we get permits and, and uh, go, get, go, go after it. Not all bark is the same quality. Some is quite thick, some is quite thin, some delaminates readily, um, some is very thick and solid and won't delaminate, some is more elastic, some is more brittle. Um, and the, the, the sad part about that or the hard part about that is, is that you just need to get experience by harvesting and learning, 
you know, which one is which and which quality is good for the things that you're after, uh, which you want, which you're trying to make. So for canoe, for example, you want really big mature trees, bark that's not too thick though, because when you build the canoe, you have to shape the hole and you need the bark to stretch a little bit um, when you hammer the ribs in. So not super thick, but not super thin. And you definitely don't want it to be the kind that delaminates. For canisters and, and um, you know, you want a kind of a medium thickness. And that's like, what does that mean medium? Maybe eighth of an inch at most um, to a sixteenth. And the main thing with birch bark is the lintels. There's these, these uh, you know, when you're looking at a tree, um, those, those black lines are called lintels, and that's, there's a little hole. That's how the tree respirates or breathes. Um, and that's the weak link in the bark. So it can crack there uh, most readily. You can see this bundle here. Um, there's a crack over to the left-hand side there. That's along the lintel line. So you have to be choosy about your bark too when you're harvesting. You don't want bark that readily cracks along the lintels. So here's a winter bark harvest. So maybe you can see the difference, but it has a darker color to it and maybe not as smooth looking. Um, when you harvest before the leaves come out or after the leaves fall, the tree has become, uh, it has grown its new layer of, of cells and that layer is stuck to the bark. So if you harvest in the winter time, you're not gonna be able to peel at all because the bark is just stuck fast. That the, the wood layer, inner, inner bark layer and bark, outer bark layer are, are stuck fast to the wood layer. Um, and so in the spring, they start to grow and you can peel with assistance. You can see I have some wooden pieces there clamped to the bark so it doesn't rip. And I slowly pull around the tree. Um, catching any little spot that grabs with a knife and, and slowly prying it off. Now what happens is that that layer is a piece of inner bark um, and that inner bark has a dark, dark amber maroon color. So that thin cellular layer is on the bark itself and when you get it wet it turns dark and that's when you can scratch off that and make designs like that etched birch bark basket that I showed. Very typical uh, Great Lakes region baskets, they're making them and, and etching all these cool floral designs. So when we say winter bark, this doesn't necessarily mean it was harvested in the winter. It means that it has that thin dark layer on it. Um, and so when it comes to harvesting too, you know, everybody always asks, does it kill the tree? And the answer is not necessarily, to be honest. I would say no, if the tree is young and healthy, you cut um, and it's one of the few trees that you can actually girdle that way because you're just taking the bark off, the outer bark, you're not taking the inner bark off. And so that inner bark is left and then the tree begins to grow and continues to grow and it slowly cracks off like in this photo. Um, underneath that inner bark is a new layer of outer bark. And this is that light yellow, that's, that's gonna turn white after all of this old inner bark breaks off. There'll be a layer of new inner bark and underneath that is a new layer of, a new layer of outer bark and then a new layer of inner bark one of the few trees that does such, such things. So it doesn't necessarily kill a tree. I've been back to trees that I've harvested from, well, I thought I had one more photo in there, but um, that I've harvested 10 years earlier and they're still alive. Now you're taking birch bark from large mature trees and you're taking 16 feet for a birch bark canoe, it's gonna kill the tree because it's just too much stress. But, so it doesn't necessarily kill the trees. It's a, I guess it's a, it's a more complex answer than that. They've gone back in Russia and har re-harvested that second layer um, 
where they do a lot of the bridge programs. So here's a, an example of sort of my current work. You know, Ramon always painted his lids black and he just said, because they sell better and it looks good. So that's what I do. You know, I don't wanna screw around with trying to find my own style when it comes to just the lid. There's other ways that I can, I can be an individual craftsperson and designer. Um, so I, I, I just do black lids and sometimes unpainted ones, but black ones look great. And usually just oiled containers. I used to paint them, but um, it takes too much time and fuss. And, and people like the, 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 the natural look to the bark. The striking lid, I think is nice. So here's some that I made. I think I made these last year. Um, every year I make a handful, a couple dozen, I guess, or I don't know, maybe 40, I don't know. And, um, and then I pedal them. So maybe some of you have one of my canisters, I don't know. So that's it for the slideshow for Birch Bark. Here's a little picture we snuck in of the, of the shop. So this is our teaching space up above for those that, for those that, um, you know, care what's going on. There's a little forging area where I'll be able to forge hook tools. And uh, I got a metal wall there for, for safety and protection. And plug the Birch Bark Canister class in September, which is coming up. There's still some spaces left. So if you feel like you want to make a trip up to Northern Wisconsin, it's a beautiful time to be here. It's a great area. Lake Superior, if you haven't been here, is is uh, one of the lesser known, uh, although just great bodies of water, largest freshwater lake in the world. So consider that, spread the word. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing. Um, I lost my, uh, there we go. So, I'm just going to check the questions. Yeah, the lenticels. Um, what I what I describe them as is they shouldn't be crusty. So this is this has been scraped a little bit, but but you can if you kind of look close, you know they're they're fairly clean and smooth. Um, I don't know if I have. A great example uh, here of, of lenticels that are no good because I just don't harvest it. But you get big crusty, what I call crusty eyes. Lenticels are known as the eyes uh, in, in Ojibwe kind of ethos. And so you want to avoid those crusty, those crusty lenticels. It's not so much that they'll leak because they're sealed up, but um, but they will crack, you know, they're, they're fragile. Again, that's like the weak grain of wood, but it's bark. You know, here's another example. You can see they're just, you can see almost the little dots in there, but this is not gonna leak, but they're not really crusty. They're very smooth, um, you know, and when you harvest, When you harvest, um, you know you peel off a little bit of a tree, and then you, you you sample it. You bend it, you 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 fold it back and forth, and so I can I can bend this along a lenticel, and it holds together for quite a long time of the bend. That's a quality bark. If it just pops, don't harvest that tree. You know, and once you have the inside, you know this is the inside. You know, you can kind of look and see what the quality of is on the inside of that, of that bark. But outside, it's, the white's been peeled off, but the inside has like a nice healed little, and again, it, they'll pop, but it's just a matter of, of when and, and how. If it's slow, that's okay. If it's fast, like pop, just don't bother. Uh, yeah, we bought a bunch of uh, bark from from Russia. Uh, 
I don't know if it's shut down or not. I'm not sure what what kind of things are happening when it comes to just they're just you know small crafts people. They they might be able to send it still. Um, if you follow up, Alan, you can uh, follow up with an email, and I can give you the contact information. And you can ask yourself. Uh, the email and they speak English. Um, uh, when you store the bark, you want to store it. If you're going to roll it up, you want to roll it up so that the the inside is out, and you roll it long ways. I don't have any rolls of bark, but like in the photo of me carrying it with my tump line, that's how you want to roll it and store it. The bark on its own wants to curl like this. And if you leave it just sitting there, it's gonna curl up so tight that you're not gonna be able to undo it, not with heat or boiling water or anything. Even this one's been sitting around for a year and it won't, it won't um, stay straight. So when you roll it up long ways like this, that prevents that curl from happening. Um, that's for like birch bark for canoes, big long sheets. If you're going to harvest for basketry or crafts, you know, you can, um, you can just store them in, in flat. You can see they're trying to curl a little bit, but, and then you weight that down with a piece of plywood and some, some bricks or rocks or something. Keep it out of the sun. I like it in the basement, something kind of humid, but not dripping wet. And again, you don't have to, it, it, bark has a lot of oil in it. So it's, it's gonna stay flexible because of the oil, not because of the moisture content, so, 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 sort of. That's the way you should look at it. Don't think of it like wood or something that has to, it dries out in a conventional sense. Um, leave that pressed. And then you can grab it and, you know, and then use it for your cracks. Um, and if it's old, don't, you know, you don't moisten it. Maybe soaking a little bit helps. Um, uh, but if it's that old and it's not flexible, it's probably not that great of bark. Some bark will last for years without any loss of flexibility. And that's like the primus bark. It's kind of how I judge it if it's really old. If it still works well, then it's good quality bark. There's some bark that's what we call purple bark. It has this real purple color to it. When that gets old, it dries like brittle, brittle. It'll literally like almost shatter. Anybody who works with birch bark uh, to, to any length knows what purple bark is and you just tend to avoid it. And you need to harvest bark off of trees that are alive. Um, dead bark is not the same thing. Um, it may work in a pinch for some things, but it just doesn't have the same quality. It's been altered because of the, what I call the agents of decay. You know, all these uh, bacteria and fungi and insects are in after that wood and rotting wood and moisture and it has a smell to it and it doesn't have the same quality. Um, I could go on and on about this. So let's move into the, the making of the box and I can just rattle on. Um, Jasmine, I'm gonna, you're gonna turn your camera on. Oh, I don't see you. Do I pin you? Give, yeah, give me a second, guys. Pin me and turn off your one. Okay, add pin. Okay, that's weird. And remove pin. Stop video. Okay, and then I'm gonna keep my mic on, right? I see me on my screen. Does everybody see me from Jasmine's point of view? Yeah, Alan's giving me thumbs up. So I don't know. Um, So here's some examples of some canisters that I've made. You okay, Jasmine? No, you, you can see. Yep. Everybody can see me from your. Everybody can see me from your lens. 
so I don't know. So, um, you know, here's some small canisters. You can use small scraps or cutoffs to make these, or or large canisters. You know, and we use these in the in the in the house for for tea, or coffee, or rice. Um, here's a small antique that um, a little snooze box. And these were manufactured actually. There's a little stamp. There's a little stamp on here. Some company's name. It says snuff. Something snuff. I can't quite read it. Uh, Wildman and Company. You know, so it's kind of interesting to think about uh, craft objects as a manufactured kind of company trinket that you'd hand out uh, for people who are snorting snuff. So it's just a cool little history. And here's a, a Russian tus, the, the water type, the water type one. All right. I ended up spotlighting this. Up. So, and again, you guys, um, you can watch this again later. Uh, take notes. There's not a lot of great information. Um, I wrote a blog that I did a how to. Um, it might be available now in the sense that the photos aren't. Uh, Watermarked. Um, I, I used to write a, a blog with old, old technology when they made us all have a photo host somewhere outside of the website. So they're kind of in photo bucket land, and I don't know how to, to deal with it. And I don't want to pay photo bucket any more money. So, anyway, I think they're available right now, but you can watch this again. And, you know, someday we hope to write a little handcraft manuals that will have these different projects in it. Until then, you can watch this video and we'll also probably end up putting all of these up on YouTube at some point. If you can, you can find Johan Hofstad's book. It's in Swedish, but it'll show you how. Hard to find book. This one as well. Swedish books. This is Russian one. I don't know where I got it. It doesn't have much in it. Um, or Vladimir's book uh, is available. So it's like a tome, and it's and it's really good. Mostly weaving, but there's some. There's a canister in there. Not this style, but okay. So you have your bark. You need a. You need an outside piece and you need a liner. So there's two piece, two components to these to these canisters. You have this outer one that's joined, and then the inner one that just has a, a, a vertical seam, no join. Uh, wooden base, wooden top, and then some bands. So I'm gonna kind of blast through this pretty quick because some of the things like sawing. I'm not going to cover. You can figure that out on your own. Um, uh, or, or like carving and fitting. You know, that's the stuff I don't need to demonstrate, but I'll, I'll demonstrate how to cut, how to fit the base and peg and cut a band. And I'll carve a, a toggle for the top. Um, but some of this stuff is just general woodworking stuff that you can figure out um, on your own. Or you can follow up with questions to the email later. Or take the class, <laughs> which is always the best. So once you have your bark, you have to decide what kind of canister you're going to make. I don't like, I don't like uh, letting the natural material dictate exactly the design. So you need about an inch and a half overlap on both sides for that join. And, that would make a really big canister, but it would be kind of squat. Um, not so bad, but um, I, I tend to like a taller, narrower canister. So, you know, 
don't let the material dictate your design entirely. You know, let it influence it, but not completely. So, and then I have this like bad bump here that I got to get rid of. So, um, when you're cutting birch bark, you can use some tin snips or just a regular craft knife, sword knife. You know, either way it works, or a customized linoleum knife. Take and grind that tip down a little bit because otherwise it's like big. And then that works great for harvesting and also cutting birch bark because you can just. So I like the snips. Yeah, and unfortunately, you know, that's, that's going to be erased. We make birch tar, right? And so, so a lot of times the ends get kind of brittle. So just out of just general practice, I just good working habit, I just would cut the end just a little bit off. Not that brittle in the sense, but it has that curl that doesn't, that doesn't go away. So now you have material that you can work with and there's a going to be no more that. So what we need to do is avoid math at all costs because <laughs> it'll just it'll just make make you screw it up. So at this point I'm going to take and just straighten one edge with a straight edge. And I'm going to clip one of the corners so that I know which edge is the, the uh, straight the straight edge. And then I'm going to lay out with the square on this edge only my joints. And this edge will be the bottom. So this, this might not be parallel. And so without parallel and square, lines, you're gonna, your joints won't work. So this is a way of avoiding any anomaly and without having to be super precise on all four sides, just on the bottom and then the two joints. So I put that straight edge toward me and I use a square. This is a Japanese square. It's just light and flexible, but any framing square would work. And lay that down along the edge. And I'm gonna draw this joint up on the chalkboard too for people. And when you're working with this, uh, practice on a piece of paper. When I teach this, I don't let anybody cut the bark until you can successfully cut it um, with, with a piece of paper or a thick cardboard, uh, thin cardboard or something. You don't wanna just screw up your precious bark. Um, the other thing is a, what's really handy is a bone folder for folding paper. Um, years ago, I was just too cheap to get one, so I just made one out of this is a piece of antler, but I also made one out of a, a cow bone, like the butcher. Um, you can buy them too, they make them like plastic and whatnot. They're probably really cheap, but that was kind of before the internet. So. There was a time before the internet. All right, so I can make this, I can score a line with that bone folder. That's one of the, the, the sides of the ends that the joints are gonna be on. And you're gonna wanna do roughly an inch and a half or so. Now, remember it by spinning it around that, that that's the true edge is away from me now. So just keep an eye on that notched corner and just, you only get to use your straight edge square on that. Okay. It doesn't matter how square these ends are. You can see this one. It's not. It's not parallel. It doesn't matter. That's all going to be inside the box. So unless you can't stand it, then you can fix it. But I'm not that type of person. Magnetic use of energy here. So now, the only math I'll use. And it's not really math. I'm just going to measure this. And it's like 
seven, seven, seven and seven eighths. But instead of doing that, like the math, dividing that in two, I'm just gonna move the, the ruler over a little bit so that half of that distance, the leftover distance to eight is on one side and the other. I can just look at it there and look at it there and say it's close enough. And I'm gonna make a mark at four or halfway. Just make a little pin prick there. And then we can cut the joints from that. We're gonna go off of that center line. So what I'm gonna do, I don't know if you well, can see this from there. I'll try to drop big. So we got this line, and we got a center line. So what type of notches are we going to use? Can you see that? Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll move up closer to the floor, or you'll see it on there. Maybe you should just, just, just so people can see. You can get over here. My shop is being dismantled for the move, so there's traffic and boxes and things. Yeah, that's a good idea. Okay, okay that's going to be the better for this. <clears throat> so we can use there's different joints. There's triangle joints or round round joints. What we'll do is the round joints. So you'll need a gouge, uh, at least one round gouge. I'll talk about that. Um, but you can just use a straight chisel to you know how to do that. So you can make triangles. So I'll draw the triangle one because that's probably most likely what you'll you'll have. <clears throat> so if you have a certain width of a of a gouge, let's just say a half inch, then that's the one you're gonna. Put it right on center. You're gonna you're gonna cut. What's going on? Um, someone said the sound is a little low, so I thought if I moved okay. the computer closer. That would, that would okay, hopefully okay. that'll be better. Um, Maybe speak up a little. Yeah, our, our mic situation is jiggly. So I was trying to kind of face the computer as much as possible. So you're gonna put a chisel mark. She said it's up. Yeah. You're gonna cut with a chisel, and then you're gonna swing your chisel over equal space and, and another chisel mark, and then another chisel mark. Um, you're gonna just punch right through. I'll, I'll demonstrate on the bark, but I wanna draw this first. So they're equally spaced with that chisel. And don't worry about how they end up on the edge. It doesn't matter, just follow the spacing of that chisel. And then you're gonna use the chisel again to make a V with two cuts. So always remember that they point in. Then we, then we take the bark and we wrap it around and we transfer those holes to this side. And then you cut the opposite of it. So, Again, I'll demonstrate in a minute, but I want to draw it. So if this is the center, you know, we've made a chisel mark there. So this next one is going to be the opposite. Um, and they're going to be. One, two, three, yeah, one, two, three. So that's how it looks. And these two are staying in. So if you, okay. And then you pick, you pick the side that is connected at the top. You can see this one intersects, you know, when we cut it out, it's gonna be missing. And this side is, is connected. This is the side you're going to make your tabs. And again, you'll see that soon enough that we're going to weave into the holes of the other side. 
Yeah, this will make perfect sense later. So then you're going to uh, uh, cut. This is going to be really hard to tell, hard to tell on this, but. And this is removed. It'll make more sense later. Someone asked if did you ever use a template to make? No because every piece of bark will be different. So if you set up a template, then you're gonna just be wasting a lot of bark. So it's really simple just to use the, 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 the chisel as the template. That, it's that simple. Um, so it's hard to draw. So when I demonstrate it, it'll make more sense. So let's move the camera back. Yeah, try to avoid any of those types of jigs because it just forces you to kind of stop, stop thinking. Um, maybe, but, but yeah, yeah, that's We can't move it there, otherwise. So there's our notch. So we want to put that on the bottom. Wait a minute. Now we've got a center line. It doesn't actually matter. So let's cut a triangle one because that's what I showed. So there's your chisel. And it's right on half. You can't see the little hole probably, but and Punch it through. And there's the space. Make a little tick mark with your chisel. Punch it through. Keep the space. Keep the space. No matter what, always just follow the pattern, even if it's just a little bit of it. Okay, so I cut. Now I'm gonna make the triangle version. Now, this is where you could mix it up and you could use a gouge. If your gouge and your and your chisel don't match, then you need to use your gouge first and then cut, cut with the chisel to fit. Um, you know, you could use a, a longer chisel or a shorter chisel. Um, This is where all the creativity comes in. But I want to make sure that I get that buck just right so they're connected as a slightly be a yeah, triangle is that all sides are equilateral triangle, not on the south. Just cutting those out. I just swing, swing the chisel over like this. And I'm trying to do this so that you guys can see. Now, Ramon Pearson is the guy who showed me how to make these with a chisel. But there's the old guy, Nils. He swore that the only way to do this is to use a knife. 
it's really hard to make nice cuts, but you could use a knife. Okay, so there's the one side. I'm gonna transfer those over. I'm gonna try to line up. That's that score line I put. I'm gonna line up that score line through there, through those holes. And I'm also gonna make sure that my bottom edge, a good edge, is lined up. Sometimes it moves, so you just want to double check. So it's on the line, the line is through there. And then you can transfer. So I just made this, I took a really fine, not, well, not a really fine needle, a bigger needle. Um, and just melted in this handle. And I don't think I even drilled the hole, I just shoved it in. And then you can, but you could use the tip of a knife. You could use a pencil if you want, but if there's any pencil remaining, it's gonna be nearly impossible to erase off the bark. And so you're gonna have to live with the finished products or finished job canister. So I like to use a little pin pin prick needle thing. So then I transfer it. Okay. And so now I have these these little pinholes here. I'm gonna put it really steady you guys. Now <clears throat> what I do is I find the middle one. <clears throat> I don't want to do that because that's what I did on this side. So I go next to it. And if they don't line up if the two pinholes are bigger than the chisel, just put, just split the difference, average. And then you're gonna do every other one. <clears throat> and then, Those triangles out. Pretend that that one's a little bit at the edge there, but I'm going to pretend that it's just a normal one. Okay, so now we have the two sides. And like I said before, we, we want the one that's intact here. This one's been cut off. This is intact and this is intact. So this is the side that I'm gonna make my tabs or uh, the mail parts, so to speak. And I'm going to do that by taking and cutting just like a sixteenth of an inch. Leave a little bit of an arrow head. This is the part that is best to practice on a piece of paper. Because I've done this a lot. If you haven't. And it's kind of weird. I remember what it was like when I first did it. It's like a little bit of a mind bender. So you have these little tabs here. So practice on a piece of paper or a card, you know, a thin like cereal box. Can you show the whole box? Okay. So this, these are going to go into these holes. So I'm just going to pause there for a second, but you guys can think about that for a moment. Okay. 
it's really easy to practice on something piece of paper. In fact, my friend from Japan who came to study for a couple of weeks, K, he really liked these, but they don't, they have birch bark in Northern Japan, but I'm like, well, why don't you try, they have a big kind of paper culture there. So you could try with some thick, really thick, nice Japanese paper to make these canisters. I don't know if he ever did, but you know, if you don't have bark, use some kind of really fancy thick paper. Try it, see, it might be really cool. Even plastic sheets. Okay, so now we can go back to stage. Leather. Leather, I've seen this joint on leather, but um, it wouldn't make a very sturdy canister, I don't think. Here, maybe. Yeah, I'm going to put it together like this. So okay. Don't need. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay, so the next phase, maybe tip it down again, Joe. Sorry. Mm -hmm. So we need to skive these because it's a little thick. So you take your sloy knife and just carefully thin down those tabs. Careful now, it's easy to cut through that birch bark. And what's cool, if you do do this with bark, you'll see all the layers of bark. Bark is made up of many compressed layers. Each year it grows. There's lots of little tricks and subtleties to the technique. Um, I would go into more length, you know, in class, um, just on how to sky and all that stuff. Okay, now you can, maybe I can do it here. Yes. So now I'm gonna put these in these holes. Um, but first I need to kind of limber these up a little bit. So I'm gonna support the tab with my finger and then I'm gonna bend the bark on two different angles and then try to fold it, try to fold it up a little bit into a triangle. Now, this is where you could use a little hot water to make that bark flexible, uh, which I have a tank on the hot plate, but the, the triangle notch is the easiest to put together. Um, so I know from experience, likely don't need any hot water to limber these, these little tendons up. Um, you want to kind of loosen up your bark a little bit, get it, get it used to the idea of what it's going to be here. And then this is where you need a couple more hands and you don't have them. So it's best to learn on a, no, you gotta do it yourself. I have to do it myself. Jasmine's trying to help me. Um, so the problem right now is trying to get this, this these, these won't go in that hole when, it, when it's on an angle like this. It, it won't do it, it has to be, oops. It, ha it can't go in those holes like this. It has to go in straight down at 90. So you need to, you need to curl the bark. And you need to curl that bark and get those in. So what I do is I reach inside and I hold it. I'm reaching inside and holding it. And then, I'll, and then I'll put them in, holding it against me. So for those that like look at some of the ones I make, imagine a canister twice as tall. See, they pop out. It's like, okay, let me have this going. You have to kind of work them in all at once. Otherwise you'll end up splitting splitting your bark. This is where that hot water comes in handy. 
and just slowly work them in. I'm reaching inside now and pulling them through. And this is a testament to the quality of the bark right here. Um, I was really able to like um, tweak and pull on those um, tabs. And then the, the, then the two ends can go, see this one, the bark is a little bit bigger. So I had to clip that one because it just taps around the end. Of it. So that's, and that's our, our clipped bottom right there. So that's the bottom of the canister. Okay, on the inside, I'm trying to use my, okay, now, then you pull it a little bit, make sure it's tight, and then you cut a liner, which is just another piece of bark same width or close. Mine's not quite the same width. So either I cut this down a little bit or I find perfect. Find the right piece of bark with just the right overlap. Okay. But this piece had a little pucker on it. I don't know. And so this liner is going to go in backward. And so you need to cut it so that there's about an inch overlap, just an inch. Too much and that too much in that inner bark, the inner liner is going to curl and pull away. So just a, a, a small overlap that's been skived. The skive helps weaken the bark so that it doesn't curl. This side's already skied because I already have this. And just tweak that. This bark is over probably over three years old and it's still just as flexible as it was it's the day I got it. Then you roll that up and then you want to put that overlap on the opposite side of your joints so that they're kind of working against each other. Looks like maybe my overlap is too much. So. And then, you know, you're tightening it up. I'm moving kind of fast, so it might be blurry. Stretch that, stretch that out. The overlap is a little too much. So I won't do it now, but I'll cut in, take it out and cut it. Should be about an inch, inch and a half. So that's the main body of the, of the canister, okay? So I prepared one this morning, different joint. Um, this is more challenging because the tab, the arrowhead is, is almost too big to fill the space. So it's really tricky to do these shallow gouged cuts. So the next thing you wanna do is take your canister and you're gonna make your base. Now you're gonna take a pencil, you're gonna squeeze it into an oval and you're gonna trace it. It just has to be rough. You got a rough oval. Can you see it? I can't tell if we can see it. It's the close page. So you have this oval.
make a, a, a crisscross of two axes, you're going to need, make sure you just keep it prepped, propped up because your, your, your vibrator is going to shake. Okay, you're going to set this compass uh, dividers for the distance across that top. And then you're going to put a mark on both sides. Okay, you can look this up somewhere too. It's how to lay out an oval with string. Uh, where did my little nail go? Here, I just have two of them. Oh, here's. Then you're going to put on those two marks, you're going to put those nails in. You could have a third one here as well. You're going to tie a string around those. Now, I like to reuse the same string instead of tying in a tight knot every time, or a knot that can't be undone. So I just do this half, I don't know what kind of knot is, it's sort of like an overhand bite. And then you replace that one with, and you just follow that around. It's just small. And you just follow that string around and it's going to make an oval. Now, you can see that the oval I made is, is, is a perfect oval, but it's a lot smaller than what I need. And that's just because I didn't set this up properly. So I'll show you guys how to troubleshoot this. It just means that this one needs to be a little bit bigger, you know. And then, and then just do it again. Or what I end up doing most of the time, if it, I just want to get that oval. <laughs> and then I'll just, I'll just trace, I'll just trace a bigger one. Because it's, it's fairly easy to see. And then when you cut it and carve it, you know, you're going to screw it up a little bit. It's not going to be perfect. So it doesn't quite show um, as much as you think, you know. So I lay out this bigger oval. I can check to see, okay, yeah, it's a little bit bigger. Um, and then I'll cut it out. So you could cut it out with, you could step back, Dennis. You know, you could, you could cut it out with, um, a big coping saw like this, you can get these. I'll wait for you to. You can get these at uh, Tools for Working Wood. I think you can buy the, the plans or the kit. And these are a, turn, a turning saw. So you, you need to clamp this down and you know you could cut all the way around. Or if you have a bandsaw, use a bandsaw. Or if not, you could use a straight saw. And just just cut as close to, to the shape as you can, and and just just carve it. So I'm producing these in mass, so I use a bandsaw. Or before I had uh, taken some time off from electrical tools, I bought this and I just used this. This works good. So you rough cut it out, and then you trim it to fit. You know, for those that like tools and stuff, like this is a cool uh, trick. This is a, a grinder for pitcher frame. And there used to be a jig on here to, to make a 45 degree. Um, I use a belt sander a lot for this, as did my teacher Ramon. Um, but in class, belt sanders suck too loud and too dusty. But this is a basically sandpaper on here. And so you can, you can shape you can shape those discs 
if you make a lot of shrink pots, you know, you know those are, this is great for shrink pots too. So you can sand, sand that shape, or you just carve away, um, or you could take a rasp and rasp it, um, sandpaper and a block. I mean, whatever way, there's no right or wrong way to do it. Um, but you want that tit, uh, the, the, you want it a tight fit. So after I get it shaped close, I'll take and line up the widest points on that oval with the line, uh, joint line. So I'll, I'll put this in, my liners are slick here. Put that in on one side and it should be a little bit tight. You're gonna to have to um, use your palm, using the palm of my hand to grab it. And then on the inside, I'm pushing up on the bark tight and trying to force that in. The birch bark canister acts kind of like a rubber band. You should really struggle to, to put it in. Um, and it should be, when you look through it, you know, you shouldn't see any light. There's just a little bit there, which I think is fine. But, you know, you can see I, I didn't quite line it up right. The, the, the joint line is here, and it's not quite lined up on the oval. So you really want to be careful. Oval is important. Why would you push it down on this? Uh, because it's really tight. And, and there might be an anomaly in the bark that might make it really tight. Impossible. My liner slipped up. There we go. Someone's asking if, it, if that bottom piece, you make sure that it's 90 degrees and not tapered. 90 degrees, yes. And what you can do to fit, to facilitate the fit is just chamfer the inside of one of the corners, that last one that you put in. But otherwise, you know, it should be tight. Hammer, you know, you have to hammer it. And I'd say, what Ramon suggested too is have it inset just a little bit. There's a little lip here. It'll just look better. And if you ever need to adjust it, like if it sits funny, you can you can lay a piece of sandpaper down and you can sand it flat. But if that base is flush, then you have to sand all of that wood as well to get it level. If, if you just leave it in inset, then all you have to do is you're just standing there or trimming with a knife. Okay. So once you get that set, then you take the base back out and you trace it on a thicker material. You know, so the base, the base material is approximately a quarter to three eighths. You don't want any thicker than that. And it's going to be a softwood, pine, conifer, cedar. And then the top lid should be an inch or so. It could be seven eighths, might be even better. Three quarter is too thin. So that's kind of the rub. Um, if you don't have access to a sawmill and Sawyer's, I would take two by two by sixes and mill them down on the table saw to get that inch instead of trying to find. But now I have rough saw number, so I can get one inch material. You can you can you can nail it down or have some nail. So then you trace that, and then you take that on the bandsaw or cut it to a six degree. So what you've traced is the smaller of the two. The taper gets bigger from what you traced. So just like the bottom, it fits into the canister, and it can get tighter, so it needs to get bigger. So wrap your head around that a little bit. 
trim that, you know, bandsaw it, cut it, trim it, carve it with a knife, rasp it, and it should fit into the box neatly and still stick out. And that six degrees is about perfect. Too shallow, it'll get wedged and you won't get it out. And too blunt and it won't stay in. Give, you know, give or take a half a degree. So on this, I, I trimmed it. My little sanding thing only works on 90 degrees. So I just took it and trimmed. And then when you're done, you can chamfer, you know, chamfer the lid. Um, a lot of times I'll take, I'll just take these to the belt sander too and set it up on six degrees. And then I'll sand this and this as well. When I was doing hand tool only, I just hand plane it, um, whatever way you want to roll, um, get that nice and fit. Okay. And then you got to peg the bottom. So I'm not going to do the whole thing, I'll just demonstrate. So you can take um, a nail and sharpen it so that it's just pointed on both sides, like a crude twist bit, or just use an electric drill in a bit. Most of us have those. And drill a hole into the base. At least four times. If I like to do six, I'll just do two for now. And it's really tricky to not drill through the bottom. Be careful. Sucks when you actually have your peg running through like that. I'll leave that. And then you need to make some pegs. So you take a block of hardwood like birch, it's end grain, so the grain's running hot up, and you can take. Chop. Or if you take a rubber band and put it around there, then they'll all stay together. And then we can just chop, 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 chop. So I make a ton of pegs. So here's here's my little my little box. I got, a, I got a twist bit that's set up the same as the hammer drill. And then I got, I got you know, all of these pegs that I, I just make. So then you grab some. And a lot of times I'll, I'll end up having to trim them. So you want to put a little, little point on them. The soft conifer. Uh, and the birch bark have some give. So they can be a little bit tight. And it's OK to put a square peg in a round hole. <laughs> it's actually beneficial. Maybe not in all parts of our life, but uh, on birch bark canisters, it's ideal. So you run that square peg in there. All the way around and then trim them off. You could use a saw, but be careful not to cut your bark. And you notice I cut from both sides and then break it and then trim. If you cut from one side only and try to break it, the split of the break will go down into the shaft of the, of the peg and it won't hold very well. So there's a little trick there. Trim it off flush. Okay. And then we're then we li literally have a workable canister now. You know, we need we we can actually just get this lid, you know, 
um, off with their hands. You could drill a hole and put a little leather toggle on it. Pop. Yeah, the two here from Russia. They just have layers of birch bark. And they're just run through and then wedged and probably glued to. There's two little wedges. The wedges aren't long ways, they're actually on the edges, which is actually pretty clever. Corneva, yeah. I don't know if she does any of this. He has the wood that can make it. Um, what Ramon did was, was make toggles. So uh, there's all these little details to demonstrate. I'm going to keep it simple. You know, there's a lot you guys can figure out on your own. We're at, we're at one hour 30. An hour 30? Okay. Um, <clears throat> I'll be, this won't take very long. So I'm going to cut, cut in. <laughs> All the way around a square piece of hardwood. This is birch. And you know, you can make all kinds of different August holes, if you will. <coughs> Carve that tendon down using some safe grips. And what you need to do is make a little piece of hardwood with the two holes or one hole. So you got something to measure against. So you can fit that in the hole. You can burnish it a little bit and you can see where you need to trim. If you use nice straight grain wood, this is the cross thumbs grip for those that are into the spring grabbing thing. It's one that's rarely taught. The reason why this is safe is because there's a shoulder <laughs> that it hits. And the safety is also that the piece of wood hits my thumb before that the blade can take my hand. So be really careful when you're learning new grips. So you're just going to carve that down. Could you paint it like Ramon if you use pinned or um, I prefer um, I prefer uh, milk paint just because it dries fast. <clears throat> but Ramon uses oil paint, and when you paint birch bark, you should use oil paint as well. Milk paint doesn't attach very oh, well. Oh, you were talking about milk paint for the tops. Yes, I think he was talking about oh, the birch bark. Yeah, use oil paint for the birch bark, and you can use oil paint for the lid too, as he does. Um, Milk, but if you're just doing the top, you could use milk paint because it, it adheres to the wood. Uh, yeah, good point. Plus, you know, that, um, who asked that question? Uh, plus, oil paint has such a beautiful, <coughs> deep uh, tone to it uh, that milk paint just doesn't get. So, I would oil my oil paint my bowls if I if it just didn't take so damn long for it to dry. So you can just keep testing until that thing gets nice and tight. You know, and then you can you can uh, carve a toggle any which way you want. You know, I'm not going to show you how to do it. Just you carve your toggle. You know, shape it however you want. I got something here that I already. You know, simple. And then you want to you want to saw that. Saw a slice in there. And 
in that tendon, right? And then you drill a hole. You drill a hole in your top and then you drive that in and then you wedge, wedge it. Put a little spot of glue on there and you run your wedge cross grain. If you run your wedge long ways, it, it could split, split the, um, it's, it's unlikely, but it's just good habit when you're, when you're wedging. Everybody wanted to see the wedge. Uh -huh. I just, I just yeah. put a little tiny. Right, it's wedged, it's wedging sideways. It's pushing in. It's not enough to hold it though. It's, it's, it's actually uh, uh, counterintuitive. So that's about it. The last thing is to put a band on. And that's really quick to, to, to demonstrate. Um, so you need, I'm just over here grabbing bark. So you need a, another strip of bark that either matches or is contrasting. It's up to you. And you need to cut a nice strip for the top and the bottom. Now, there's some tricks, aesthetic tricks. The, uh, the bottom band should be slightly wider than the top band by maybe a 16th of an inch. And if you do that, oops, you're going to have a better looking can than if they're both the same. So again, that top one is just a little narrower. Or the bottom one is just a little wider. I usually cut them both at the same time, cut the wide one, cut the narrow one. And then it's the same joint as we used before. Turn this thick end off here. I'm gonna sky a bit. And now I need a narrower chisel or a knife. I'll use a chisel. So this is the same uh, as before, except we're just making one. So right in the center, plunge that in. And we'll, we'll do a close up for you guys. Then you need a chisel that's as wide as your strip to make that V or the triangle. Okay, so. So same as before, and it's pointing in. You know, it's pointing in the distance. <clears throat> and then, that's probably right there. You wrap that around. Cut it maybe an inch or two longer. Sky it. And then lay it on there. Take your little pinprick, make your two marks. Just the same as the box. Now you're going to cut the opposite, but you're going to make it just a little bit smaller. So you're going to move it toward the middle. What a, what a 16th. Cut those two shoulders. Cut the two halves of the triangle. Just pretend it's a really wide sheet. And you're going to make the other end. It's literally the same thing as the main box. It's just a little bit funny to think about with just one. Then you're gonna put that through. Give it a twist. 
have you have a band with scribed ends on the inside. And you put it on your box. I like to put the, the joint on the opposite side of the main joint. You're gonna put the joint section first, support it on the table, and then you're gonna stretch it on like a rubber band. And there's obviously limits, so you'll find out. But make it tighter than loose. And then you can just push it on, and that will just stay on its own. It'll never come off. <clears throat> when you do the top one, you don't want to make it so tight that it 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 forces the the bark liner tube to loosen. So you you keep it kind of snug, and then what, before I slip it into place, I'll just drop. I'll just drizzle a little bit of yellow glue, wood, wood glue inside, and then slip it down. And then I'll take a piece of garbage bag and lay it on there. Plastic bag, Plastic bag yeah. And then put the lid on and then, and then let it drop. Okay. So I left some stuff out, but it's all there, you know, the details, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, let's just field a couple questions and then, sure. and then we'll... Okay, so you've got two minutes or chat your questions. I'm going to um, turn mine on. Or door comments. Yeah, I'll, I'll turn off this. Did you turn yours on yet? Yes, yeah, so it's mine's on. Okay, folks. Yeah, I hope that answers some of the questions. Like I said, I blogged about this and those photos may be accessible. You could just do a search. Um, um, yeah, Alan, follow up with the Russian birch bark supplier. Um, I don't think it's cheap, but it's really nice bark. Russian bark is some of the best bark I've, I've seen. And they sent like all prime bark, like it's, it's hands down, like just prime. Um, yeah, it's Coroneva and Rodney. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, thanks, Charles. You, you, you did find it and used it. Yeah, and, and again, hopefully, you know, um, you know, we want to do these little manuals, like how to make a birch bark box or how to make a canoe quarry basket or, you know, and then they can, you know, this is like pipe dream stuff, but that would be really cool in the future. Um, but until then, there's this video, the blog, and uh, or classes you could take. Anything else? It doesn't seem like it. Can you just say again because it's important and people might watch it in the future. Yeah. Who, who you are. Who... Yeah. Um, so yeah, thanks for watching. Um, we'll send these out to everybody. Um, and have a good rest of your day. Okay. It's, it's never N E V E R and it's by Johan Hopstead, J O H A N N Hopstead, H O P S T A D. He did a bunch of Swedish crafts books in the 70s. Um, let me take a screenshot of it. Good luck finding it. I've been looking for a couple of other Johan's books, um, unless you know people in Sweden, which I do, and I've reached out to them, and they still have a hard time finding them. Someone wanted to know how much longer you have to be back. Oh, I didn't see that question. Yeah. Um, uh, in Northern Wisconsin, it's probably still okay. Um, I usually went at 4th of July. Um, hottest, humidest days ever. We're having a cooler summer, relatively speaking. And so today would be a great day. It's at peak growth. 
when all that stuff, uh, cellular activity is happening, packing on another layer of cells that the bark is loose. So you just got to try. Um, but getting into late July, it'll start to be a little bit more sticky and you'll see that winter layer attached. Um, but uh, you could still go after it, you could try. Um, shady trees are better than trees in the sun uh, for some reason. Um, but yeah, end of June, early July was my kind of peak. Uh, yeah, end of June to, to late July is my peak, peak uh, birch bark harvesting time. All right, folks, uh, you know where to find us. Uh, thanks for signing up and watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, you got something out of it. And again, if you want to throw down a couple bucks for the donation to help, that that'd be awesome. But it's still it's it's free. Whatever. All right. See y'all later. Cheers. <laughs>